What's up, collectors? Welcome back to Films by Color, and welcome back to the Criterion Corner podcast, where we talk about one Criterion title at length every single episode. And we've hit a milestone episode today. This is episode number 10. We've hit double digits. Uh, we've done 10 of these. I am your host, DJ, and I'm back in the Criterion Corner again with my wonderful co-host, as always, Connor Nielsen. How are you doing, buddy? What's going on? Hey, I'm doing all right. Uh, happy to talk about some 1920s silent comedy with you. Uh, yeah. Fun. yeah, man. Today we are talking about uh, 1925's The Freshman, starring Harold Lloyd. Uh, last time we did an episode, we talked about a little pre-code horror film from 1932. Uh that was Island of Lost Souls. And today we're going back even further, like Connor said, back to the silent era for our first silent comedy on this series. We've been on one other silent film, but that was Passion of Joan of Arc. Not a comedy, uh, very serious. So I'm excited to talk comedy with you, man. We have never talked about uh, silent comedy before on this show or in our regular personal life, I don't think. I don't think we've talked about it. I don't really know your opinion on this. I don't know how up to date you are on your silent comedies. Uh, not too much actually i know you've talked to me about watching through some of these harold lloyd movies watching through chaplin films acquiring the buster keaton filmography in the kino mm -hmm. classics line uh, showing your uh children them like you've, you've kind of informed me on your journey through silent comedy uh, but it is actually something of a blind spot for me oh. um i've seen the gold rush I've seen Modern Times, and, and this is actually the only Harold Lloyd film I've seen. This is not the first time I've seen it, but it is the only Harold Lloyd, and I don't think I've even seen any of Buster Keaton's features. I've seen a couple of his shorts way back when I was in college, but uh, it is a bit of a blind spot, but I do love silent films a lot. The silent mm -hmm. era might be my favorite era of film, just in general. I just love it aesthetically. I love it cinematically. I love it uh, just on an emotional level. Of, I love the way so much of that storytelling makes me feel. Like one of my great passions is finding like the origin points for so many different things. And so seeing something like this, which is very foundational, just not just for comedy, but also for just the sports film um, like formula, it's all here, um, but I'm excited to get into the weeds with you too. Uh, so why don't I ask you, um, what's your experience with Harold Lloyd? What's your experience with this movie? Uh, have you seen it before? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to start the discussion with. I was going to hold off on getting into the movie and talk a little bit about Harold Lloyd first. So thanks for the perfect segue. You gave a little bit of your background. Uh, I'll go ahead and give mine. I have seen a few more Harold Lloyd movies than you have. Um, the first one I saw was Safety Last, which has kind of become his most well-known film these days, although the one we're talking about today was a much bigger hit at the time. Uh, but Safety Last, I watched on the Criterion channel uh, a couple, couple years ago, and then I had the pleasure of seeing it in a theater here just this year, the beginning of this year. Saw that uh, with a live organ accompaniment at the Strand Theater here in Marietta, which was awesome. I got to take my son to see it for the first time. And then, uh, speaking of my son, we also watched Speedy together, which is another classic Harold Lloyd silent comedy. This is his last silent film. Uh, 1928 is Speedy. So I saw Safety Last, then I saw Speedy, and then I saw the one that we are watching today. We are watching, or excuse me, the one we're talking about today. We're talking about The Freshman. Watched this for the first time last the end of last year when I was doing my homework and prepping for my top 10 autumn movies uh and you know college starts in the fall and uh, i thought this might make the list it did not make my list not because it's not a great movie uh but i was kind of focusing more on films that kind of reminded me of the season and it it's not that fall there's just one there's not that many like autumnal scenes anyway that's that's not important to this discussion but uh but yeah that's the first time i saw it and um then I had, you know, you had brought up at the end of last year that you wanted to talk about this film. This is your pick. Uh, so I was excited to watch it again because I remember, you know, having, having uh, fond memories of it. I will say that I did not immediately gravitate towards Harold Lloyd's style. And we can go ahead and jump into his style. I think he kind of stands out uh, from other comedians of his day, other silent comedians, because he is just kind of an everyman. He's just kind of a normal guy. That was the character he created. Other people like Keaton and especially Chaplin are like kind of these larger than life characters. Uh, they're kind of a little bit more over the top. Uh, and as a person who loves fantasy and kind of 
surreal kind of filmmaking. Uh, I think I gravitated more towards that. Uh, and when I started with Harold Lloyd, like I said, when I saw Safety Last, I was like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. He might just be a little too, uh, a little too normal, a little boring, maybe. It was my first impression. But uh, he's definitely grown on me. And I think that's actually his strength is that he's just the every man. And I think that kind of lends itself to relating to his character a little bit more. And uh, we'll talk about it in the freshman, especially this one. He is, this one has so much heart and uh, it's kind of a little different. Even between, even among the, uh, the Harold Lloyd films that I've seen, it's less gaggy and even though it is hilarious and more uh, character driven, which I found really interesting. And I, something I didn't notice till this last viewing. Yeah, um, actually, I would be surprised if uh, Harold Lloyd didn't influence the Clark Kent persona uh, yeah. of Superman because he does have the big glasses. He is, like you said, something of an everyman. He's a little clumsy, a little awkward that gets him into shenanigans. Mm -hmm. um, but it is endearing. It is uh, interesting to compare him to the likes of uh, Chaplin or Keaton because it's interesting how, and I was thinking about this while watching it this time, how kind of cyclical uh, tastes and preferences within a certain genre can be. Mm -hmm. Because in the silent era, you do have these larger than life uh, characters or these, uh, these uh, comedians who have these personas. Now, I have not seen Speedy, but I noticed that uh, in that movie, in this film, Harold Lloyd is playing Harold Speedy lamb in mm -hmm. the movie speedy he's playing harold speedy something else and i imagine that's maybe something that carries on through a number of his other films and then in all of chaplin's films he's the tramp in most of his films he's playing that tramp persona or subverting it in some way and then sometime after this throughout the 60s into the 70s and 80s uh comedy becomes much more of like this ensemble collaborative thing right where you have like John Landis is working with Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis, and then Dan Aykroyd and Harold Ramis can go off and work with Jason Reitman and Bill Murray, and then they can go off and work with these. So there's all of these different kinds of comedians, but they're all sort of in these different troops and all hanging out in different circles, and those circles are mingling around with one another. And out of that, you get something like the variety show, like Saturday Night Live or In Living Color. And then out of that, you get the resurgence of that one personality taking over and having their own vehicles where their persona is selling the film. So out of In Living Color, you get Jim Carrey, who is now sort of like a newer Harold Lloyd, where his wacky persona is why you're going to see the movies. And out of SNL, you get Mike Myers and Adam Sandler and any of those other uh, sorts of larger than life personalities. And then again, it does kind of become more collaborative once you get into the 2010s. Uh, where you do have like uh, Paul Feig has his like collection of like uh, you know comedians he likes working with like Kristen Wiig and Melissa McCarthy and Kate McKinnon and it's just kind of interesting how that all keeps going in and out of fashion and you can trace that back to here and this era with someone like Harold Lloyd and Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. Yeah, that is, uh, and we'll get into his comedic style, especially in this film, and I feel like how it has come back in vogue at this point. Uh, which is very interesting. But I will say one more thing about Harold Lloyd is that he, another way he stands out from the comedians of his time, uh, not just his persona, but the way he made films. Uh, he is very much more a product of his time than uh, a Keaton or uh, a Chaplin. He, those are a little bit more timeless, whereas uh, Harold Lloyd makes his films very, like they're, they're, a window into the past. They're very much like a snapshot of what the 20s were at the time. If you, he shoots like on real streets in the 20s and he shoots on real colleges in the 20s, in stadiums in this one. He shoots real car, 20s cars, real people, uh, which I think may have hurt him oh, in, you know, in, 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 uh, in decades after him a little bit. He's hurt his films because they weren't as timeless as a Chaplin stuff. But I think now so that was, that were so far removed from it, they work so great as that snapshot of the twenties and you kind of see what things really looked like back then. And I think, uh, it's a very interesting way. And I think he's probably a very good example of silent cinema to, to convert people to silent cinema. If you're not a big silent cinema fan, uh, especially, and, and you can talk about that a little bit since this was one of your first big silent comedies that you've seen, but, uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. I, I like Harold Lloyd a lot. The people in his day liked him a ton. He was the he sold more tickets in the 1920s than any other silent comedian of his time. He was huge, and uh, he has some some really classic films that have lasted for a long, long time. And thanks to Criterion, we have some really, really nice releases of them that we can get to. So let me go ahead and give a little intro of the film, and we'll jump into talking about that now that we've talked a little bit about the man himself. This is, like we said, The Freshman from 1925, directed by Fred C. Neumeyer, and second directed by Sam Taylor, uh, starring Harold Lloyd as the titular freshman, uh, Harold Lamb, as Connor just mentioned, and then Jabina Ralston as Peggy, uh, Brooks Benedict as the college bully, Pat Harmon, really great as the football coach, and then a wonderful little uh, performance by a little-known actor, Joseph Harrington, that barely did anything else as the college tailor, uh, which was a really fun scene. I'll go ahead and read a quick synopsis. Uh, this was a synopsis that Harold Lloyd gave for the film itself, himself. It's about a bright-eyed but naive young man who has an obsession with being the most popular kid in school, but goes about it in all the wrong ways. And, uh, I had a lot of fun with this one. I can't wait to hear what your thoughts were about the film. Uh, like I said, this was Harold Lloyd's biggest hit at the time. Uh, it was his most successful film. It was, this is, I, I pulled some, I heard some stats on the commentary and uh, it kind of blew me away. This was uh, his biggest hit and the second most successful comedy of the entire silent film era, which is wow. crazy. This was the third biggest release of 1925 comedy or otherwise, like it's just any film. This was the third biggest film. And uh, the influence that it had on um, college films after this was kind of insane. There was apparently from 1929 to 1925, there was only 12 college films. But then immediately after this, from 25 to 28, just three years, there were 60 college films. So wow. <laughs> everybody Whoa. wanted that, that Errol Lloyd money, apparently. But yeah, let, go ahead. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, as I'm losing my voice, I'm gonna take a sip of water. I'll give it over to you. What, uh, what was your first impression of this film? I know you watched it last year for the first time. So I watched this because my brother actually went to a screening of this movie um, at the New Beverly Cinema. They were showing this on a double bill with a uh, girl shy, another one of Harold Lloyd's comedies. They were actually doing a three night Harold Lloyd film festival showing six films total. And actually Harold Lloyd's granddaughter was there to introduce the films and talk about them a little bit. Mm. Um, and upon seeing this, my brother like was so enthusiastic coming out of it, talking like Connor, you have to see this movie and actually to motivate me to watch it is, which is why I actually picked this. We've been talking about talking about this movie for a very long time. Mm. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, when my brother came up to visit for Christmas, that's actually when we watched it together and I oh. saw it for the first time. Um, I, I got to watch it with him and I really liked it. And then it was really cool because watching it today, uh, it's been three and a half coming on four months since I'd seen it. Mm -hmm. And it actually held up exactly like the first experience I had with it, like nothing changed. Oh, I had wow. the exact same experience with it, which is a good thing because I do really like this movie. Um, I think it's a movie that, for me anyways, uh, gets better as it goes on. I think it gets funnier as it goes on. And I think it gets funnier as it goes on because I think the heart becomes more and more prominent as it goes on as well. Um, I think it's just one of those things where uh, the success of it really does rely on its star. Uh, it's a Harold Lloyd picture. Uh, he didn't direct it, but he, he was very, uh, I know, involved creatively with the directors, with mm -hmm. the people writing it. Um, because, you know, at that point, I think his persona was so well defined. Uh, so he had a lot of pull over that stuff, but, uh, Harold Lamb is just such an endearing character. I think just on paper, it has a lot of interesting things to say about popularity. I mean, as a comedy and it's, you know, it being silent, uh, you know, it's each scene is pretty broad, like the, the intent of the scenes and like the way the scenes play out are not very complex it's it, it, the intent of them is very simple and the moral that it's you know trying to portray is very simple but i think in that simplicity of it there are a lot of neat little nuances to just the concept of popularity the different kinds of people that you run into uh in that kind of a situation mm -hmm. um i think in the in that regard like it actually does have a lot to offer and i think that's what makes it such a compelling feature and not just something that could have been a fun short Absolutely. And uh, I think the heart is really what 
what does that. If you watch the, like I said, I mentioned the commentary which has, uh, and we'll go over the supplements a little bit later, but uh, the commentary has film critic, help me out, what's his name? Uh, uh, Leonard uh, Malton. Oh, Leonard Malton. Leonard Malton is on the commentary and he says, in like the first 15 minutes, he talks about how normally there will be many more, much, many more gags by this point. But this one really, and I know you don't have anything to compare it to, but this one really takes its time setting up the character first and like really getting you on his side before uh, he starts dropping all the gags. And then once they start, they don't, they kind of don't ever stop. Like you said, it just keeps building and building till the end. Although I will say after this feeling, I think it kind of peaks for me at the fall frolic. I think that is maybe my favorite set piece. I don't know if the football, the football scene is amazing. It's the scale of it is just absolutely insane, but I don't know if it gets funnier than the fall frolic for me. That, that I would have <laughs> corrected me. There. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, and speaking of that, uh, an interesting tidbit about this was he, the way he worked was he would normally shoot the big spectacle first, the big uh, giant set piece, the comedy scene first, and then he would just kind of construct the character and the plot around that. But in this version, he tried to do that and they actually started shooting the football scenes and it wasn't working and he couldn't, he, he felt like he just didn't understand the character. So they completely stopped. They went back and then they decided to film it in sequential order and they built up the character and the story first. And then they, sh they shot the football scenes at the end like they appear in the movie, uh, which is wow. very interesting because that's how you were introduced to it. And it works so well after you're on his side by the time you get to that crazy football scene. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, shooting in, in sequence is obviously not something many uh, films do. Uh, and that is like the the shooting the big things, the most complicated things first is, you know, very classic. And this is something that they were the rule book that they're writing, you know, in this time. I wouldn't be surprised if like that's how Roger Corman worked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he would tell Martin Scorsese, you know, when he was making Box Car Bertha, shoot all the stuff on the trains first. And Scorsese's like, that's the hard stuff. And Corman's <laughs> like, exactly. So that way, if you ever get behind, you know, you're behind and you don't have to worry about potential of getting behind, you know, in the, in, in the future. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if Corman probably picked it up in the industry. And like, that's just like this thing that's been well known going back to Harold Lloyd. Uh, but I do think it kind of works with this because, you know, for me, I do kind of find that I'm finding out more about this character as I'm watching him, you know, is he, so naive like what where is he coming from like what does he want out of being popular why does he want to be popular uh, i, I kind of do pick up on it as it goes along and there's a lot of very i think very neat visual things that harold lloyd uh and the directors do uh to make that kind of you know to speak about it you know he has a picture of uh what's his name uh trask the <laughs> the captain of the football team he has that picture of him on the wall and then he has his own picture that was in the uh, newspaper and you see him sort of like ascending on the wall and, and mm -hmm. that sort of stuff really speaks to you and i feel like in those little moments is where uh, lloyd and his uh directors and writers are finding the character absolutely um uh, yeah let's just let's just talk about the heart a little bit and then and then we'll get into the comedy uh, a little bit later but uh, very interesting. I wanted to ask, I want to show a quite, pose a question to you. He's mm -hmm. inspired by a movie character at the beginning of this. Um, and he, and everything that he does, his, his opening line, his nickname and his, his amazing little dun, 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 his dance that he does every time he shakes someone's hand, which is probably the funniest thing uh, in the movie. Uh, he gets all from a movie. Uh, and it's hilarious that, that, that joke that his, his dad says where he's like, I'm afraid if he, if he acts like that movie at college, they're either going to uh, break his heart or break his neck, <laughs> which was a great line. But um, did you ever have that? Were you, was there ever like a, can you think of just a main, whether in high school, college, anything, a, a movie character that inspired you so much that you like modeled your life after him? Because I do have one. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I, I was actually thinking about that while watching it. And I don't think I did. Uh, in elementary school, I was, I was the Star Wars kid. And that 
was uh so even though you know you could point to like star wars as like this pop culture touchstone uh it did make me very popular <laughs> and so i think <laughs> moving forward i i learned from that experience and you know hid away if, if i did like a character i didn't really uh consciously try to uh embrace that kind of persona to try to be popular or anything uh but what about you dj yeah i didn't i mean i, I wasn't anything like Harold uh, in this film, but uh, I did when the Amazing Spider-Man came out, uh, the first Amazing Spider-Man film, I really, really uh, fell in love with that film. I know it's not a very beloved film by uh, a lot of people, but the character of Peter, I really, really connected with that kind of outcast character that he plays in that. And I, I didn't like start trying to talk like him or anything like Harold does, but I, I remember I bought when it was time to upgrade my glasses, I bought very specific similar glasses to what he wears in that film. And then I also <laughs> started doing my hair up. That was the first time I started doing my hair up. I had just like normal, flat, straight down, like straight down shaggy hair my entire life until 2012 when I saw that movie, I finally started doing my hair up uh, for the first time. Kind of like he has it, not like this, but like straight up like he has it uh, in that film. And I don't know, that 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 character, is, I get not, just the character, but Andrew Garfield, I guess, uh, in that film, I was, I was kind of, uh, embracing my Harold Lamb a little bit when that movie came out. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's great. Um, but yeah, and it's interesting that it's interesting speaking of the heart of this film and, and kind of the lesson of this film where he has to kind of embrace being himself, uh, how it kind of mirrors Harold Lloyd's career, because when he first started, he apparently had like a tramp like character where he was kind of going for a chaplain thing. Um, and then it didn't really catch on. It didn't really work. And then he eventually, so it's very similar to this. And then it, it wasn't until he created his own character, who, which they call the glasses character, um, where he throws on those, those circle Harry Potter looking glasses that uh, was very rare at the time. Apparently you didn't really see people in movies with glasses on. That's why he did it. Cause it was so, so different and, uh, and striking. Uh, but then he really caught on when he was kind of it's not exactly a parallel because he's not just being himself. He's still being a character, but it's much more of a, of a low key kind of normal every, everyday character like we talked about. And uh, it worked. Everyone loved him. Apparently the sale of those kind of glasses like went through the roof and, all, and everyone was buying those glasses. So uh, yeah, he was, he was very popular uh, in his day. And I think this film is very uh, emblematic of his, of his whole career. That's, and, and the three films I've seen of him are all very similar. Um, he is... He's, he's, he's a quintessential American character. Like he, he's just a, he, he comes from nothing. He has a goal and he achieves that goal in, in all the three films I've seen through just sheer willpower and determination. Uh, like uh, in Speedy, he, he's trying to get the girl. Uh, in uh, Safety Last, he is trying to be successful in the big city. And here, of course, he's trying to be popular at college and... Uh, and he, you just root for him. Like you want him to get there. Whereas that's another way. I keep saying this. That's a, kind of another way he's uh, distinguishes himself from Chaplin and Keaton where they really lean into the outsider characters and kind of on the fringe of society. And they often don't win at the end. Um, he's kind of the opposite of that. He, he makes success in society something that is achievable but also desirable. Like something that he actually wants. And you want him... And I think you're on his side the whole time. I think he wins you over, uh, which is interesting given his sense of comedy. And we can kind of trans, we can talk about the comedy a little bit, but um, I, I feel like his sensibility, especially in this film, have come full circle. Like cringe comedy, awkward comedy, like coming back in, especially in America, like through The Office and uh, all those shows in the 2000s. This is very much cringe comedy. Like that, that, and that, uh, scene in the auditorium where he's talking to everybody and uh he's just kind of yeah it's it's i don't know i, I can't believe i can't think of a better word than cringe but uh, that's what they that's what they call it these days so that's what's fresh <laughs> in my mind but i feel like it's come back in vogue yeah um i got a question for you then mm -hmm. do you think that him making a character who was very much inspired by a relatable movie character is sort of him commenting on his own persona 
So you talk about how like those sales of like glasses, the one like the ones he wore, went through the roof after he became a star. Do you think it's one of those things where he's kind of conscious of like, okay, I'm I'm kind of a big star now, and I'm going to be in this college movie, and I imagine a lot of people who watch this are going to sort of take what I'm doing and maybe roll with it in the real world. So now I'm playing a character who watches a movie and rolled with it. And do you think like that was maybe an intentional choice? I think so. Even if it wasn't intentional, I think it's still a product of his career at that time. I mean, 1925 was the peak of his silent film. Like I said, uh, he had already done Safety Last, which is 23. And then Speedy was his last one in 28. So this was like right at the peak of his silent cinema. And I haven't seen any of his talkies yet. I know he has some, some really well-known talkie films too. None of them in the Criterion collection, by the way. So Criterion, get on that because uh, I'd love to see some of his, some of his talkie films. <laughs> but no, I think so. I think it, I think this might become my, I think this is probably my favorite film of his um, at, at this point. Oh. Uh, even though I love Safety yeah. Last and it was great seeing that in the theater. This one just, yeah, you just root for him. So, so he does the groundwork to just set up that that lovable character. And he's, he's still the same character in the other films, but but uh, I don't know, there's something about this one. And I think that it might be the relationship with Peggy. Um, in the other two films I've seen, the, the the female lead just kind of is there at the beginning as motivation that comes in at the end, where this one, she's in it the whole way through. And I think she's great. She did, uh, I think, six movies with him. And this was her fourth. Wow. Um, that What's her name again? Uh, Jabina, Jabina Ralston. She's great. I liked her quite a bit in this. She has um, all the all the kind of big, uh, heart wrenching, sentimental moments. I think she brings the scene where he's trying. He's so excited. She goes to tell him that he didn't actually make the team, and they're just making fun of him. And he's so excited to tell her. He's like, "Oh yeah, I, I gotta tell you this. I just made the team." And she just can't bring herself to tell him. Uh, I, I love that mm -hmm. scene a lot. I think she's great. She is great in it. Um, going back to the, uh, the to the comedy that you were talking about earlier, I um, I think this movie gets funnier as it goes on. I don't know where you fall on that, but like I think some of the earlier gags, like in concept, I get what they're doing. They're maybe kind of amusing, but mm -hmm. you know they don't make me laugh. Like the the early bit where he's just doing all the the college chants and yells. And his father's listening to the radio and he's like, I got China. <laughs> he's like, oh, OK. You know, it's, I can see that in like a Looney Tunes cartoon. Um, it's a little far fetched, but uh, whatever. Yeah, there's, there's a um, couple and, timely gags. That's apparently a really timely one where people used to actually do that. They're called radio liars. Like they would brag about how they could pick up signals with their crystal radios from like across the country and other countries and stuff. So like, oh, that's, okay. that's one yeah, of the jokes that plays that into... you kind of have to be super familiar with at the time. Uh, another joke that is like that is like prohibition. They all have like flat. Everyone just has a flask, uh, which is mm -hmm. weird if you don't know that it takes place during Prohibition. So there's a couple ones, but well, I actually think that yeah, go ahead. I actually think that joke works in, in spite of that. But like, um, yeah. but the, uh, the but a few of the other gags. So it's like, well, you talk about a radio liar. That's actually in one of the earlier um, title cards, yeah, yeah, or you know, inner titles where it is saying like, oh, you know, he was the world's best bookkeeper and the worst radio liar. I'm like, I don't know what that means. And so <laughs> when you say that that whole gag plays into that, like, you're right, that is more a product of its time that completely went over my head. And then another one is when they're introducing the school bully, the uh, inner title says, like, he would make so-and-so look like the good Samaritan. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know who that so-and-so is. <laughs> yeah, a very specific <laughs> title card right there. Um, but the title cards are great. I think they're actually really funny. Um, I do too. I do too. <laughs> they're written really well. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I, we can go ahead and jump into the comedy. I talked a little bit about like what I think it is and how I, how I think it's held up over the years and uh, why I think it's a very good intro to, uh, and do you think that, do you think it's a very good, in, like, as someone who it's one of your first silent comedies, you think it's a good one to start with? I do. Yeah. So it worked for you? Um, I would say so. Yeah. He, uh, Lloyd was very like, very, he was kind of like Tati in this way, where he would c continue to preview his films for, for audiences and cut them up and keep editing them, keep editing them until he got them just right. Um, so he would, like I said, keep showing them to audiences and he really wanted to only put the jokes in that responded well, that got the most laughs. And an example of this is at the fall frolic scene where he's doing the, the suit falling apart. 
Uh, he's, he can only afford a cheap suit and uh, it keeps falling apart on him. He did not want to go all the way to losing his pants. He thought that was too obvious. He thought people would be expecting it. He didn't want to do it, but he just kept showing it to audiences and everyone just kept saying he has to lose his pants. He has to lose his pants. So he brought everyone back and reshot that ending bit uh, where wow. he cut off his pants. So he's kind of a perfectionist in that way, like, like Tati is. Um, and it's interesting because I think nowadays we have the perspective where we, we don't like that. We don't, they're, they're uh, like test audiences are kind of a bad word these days sometimes where it's like, just let the, mm -hmm. we, we have the artistic integrity view where it's like, just do your thing. Don't worry about what the audience thinks. But this, uh, he, he was very adamant to only include the stuff that was working with, with the test audiences and it worked. I mean, it's, it, it, it's pretty timeless. I don't know. I don't know exactly why that works and, and, and we, why we don't think it works these days. Maybe just a different style of filmmaking but i thought that was interesting yeah well i can understand where paraboloid comes from because so much of comedy is not is trying to do the unexpected and if you just do something that is expected that's predictable then it's not funny right and mm -hmm. you want to subvert the expectation in a very clever way um but i think that him losing his pants is actually narrative to the or sorry it's, it's actually important to the story yeah um, i don't know how else because that's that scene well, like the whole point of like uh, the movie is he's trying to keep up this persona that he can't keep up forever. Mm -hmm. And it, it's sort of emblematic in that suit. And so that suit falling apart and him trying to p patrick it and get it all together, <laughs> you know, it's it's suggestive of what's going on with his character. And so him completely losing it, pants included, like that's the inevitable uh, point for that character to reach is that it, the, the suit falls apart completely to where it's completely embarrassing it's necessary <laughs> so i think it actually is good like and it's funny as well like i think it works both on a comedy and a narrative level yeah i think the funniest like i said that's probably the funniest scene for me and i think the the funniest part in that scene is when his pants ripped the first time and the uh, tailor is sewing them up and he's kind of it looks like he's sitting in the chair, but his legs are like flailed out behind him, in, <laughs> behind the curtain, and the guy's sewing them. And then the, he's having these dizzy spells uh, that they set up earlier. The tailor is, <laughs> and the tailor passes out across his legs, and you just see him just, you see Harold just mm, slump out of frame as he falls, slowly falls on him. I watched the, I watched that scene uh, with my son today after his nap time. I was, I was rewatching it before we talked about it today. Um, and he was, he was laughing with cracking up with me at that scene. Cause, uh, that, that was the, that was the peak for me. Uh, and I really like the football stuff, but I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if it's just a sensibility thing, but I don't think it gets past the, uh, that the way that scene just builds and builds and builds. <laughs> I think it's great. I think the fall frolic is absolutely the best thing in the movie. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a, it is like the achievement of the movie. Um, I, it's, I love me a good, like ball sequence, like a good, like even a good dance number, what have you, um, like the party at 12 Oaks and gone with the wind. I, I love how that whole thing is staged. Um, the, the Christmas party in, uh, meet me in St. Louis is like my favorite part of that movie. I, I just, I love it. And this is kind of in that same kind of vein That's where right. it is this big get, uh, get together. We're all kind of, everything sort of comes to a head dramatically. Um, but, you know, and then, of course, the big football is like his redemption. He finally gets to, you know, win on his own terms in, in his own way. That's true. He's uh, coming to his own at that point. But, uh, yeah, early on, like, I find the movie amusing. Uh, and, you know, it's good humor. It's making me smile. I like the way it makes me feel. But it's not making me, like, laugh out loud. Um, eventually it does, though. Yeah. I, I, get, I, get a, I get a I get a couple chuckles. I think, like, the, the, the sequence where he has to awkwardly give a speech you compared it to like something in the office um i, th I like it to see more conceptually than in practice although the part where the cat comes out of his sweater like it's just, like malformed second head that gets a laugh out of me yeah. and then later when he's like i'm gonna buy everyone some ice cream and they're like marching down the sidewalk and yeah. then more and more people are coming and then like what is like a whole like classroom comes out and they're all joining in and it cuts to harold lloyd's exasperated nervous face that makes me chuckle. Um, but when we get to the fall frolic, there are like just like actual laugh out loud moments uh, that I, that get me that bit you're talking about where <laughs> the, 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 the tailor like passes out over his legs. That gets me. Um, I, I love the bit where um, his arm doesn't have its sleeve on it. And so he has the tailor, you see his uh, black sleeved 
arm of the tailor, like having to oh, the third arm. play as his arm. <laughs> and he puts the $10 in the guy's pocket. And then you see Harold Lloyd's white sleeved arm come back out and remove the $10 and put it back. That made me laugh. But the biggest laugh for yeah, me amazing. is where um, he loses his suspenders and the one woman thinks she's lost her garter and, you know, takes his suspenders away and it cuts back to him and he has this completely exasperated like oh no look on his face and that was actually the biggest laugh for me i don't know what it is but harold lloyd has a perfect like reaction face oh so when he cuts like a close-up of his face and it's just sweaty and like he's he's in too deep great great stuff that and that and another scene that's perfectly uh representative of that is the the first tryout scene where he is trying out mm-hmm. for the team and he becomes the dummy and uh, they're gonna they're all tackling him and the coach goes come on you guys this isn't you're not tackling hard enough you got to tackle as hard as you can and then his fa- it pans over to him and his face is just like he's <laughs> just like horrified <laughs> <laughs> that scene is great um, well that yeah go ahead that scene I think just like completely plays into what makes him such an endearing character. Um, I love the music in this movie. It has that, you know, college fanfare. And I don't know when that that score was added to it. I don't know if that's a, obviously it would just be the piano player at the time. I don't know if that score was added later or not. I couldn't really find anything out about it, but um, it's great. I I was, I was humming it for like all day today. It's really good. There's a lot of different, there's a couple different themes in it that I, that I kept humming. It's Mm -hmm. really good. You have like kind of the more like, sadder you know kind of melodic thing you have like the love theme and then you have that triumphant fanfare and you have the but one just for his like, handshake like dun, 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 yes dun, dun, that's dun. true just every time he does the handshake it's great <laughs> but that scene where like not that scene but that shot in that in, in the scene where the tryout scene mm-hmm. where he gets thrown down the cellar and then he's like walking back up and you have the triumphant fanfare playing and it, that's like that's his hero shot i think that is everything you need to know about this character he's you know not maybe he's not the best equipped for this but he's he's got all the spirit and all the heart and he's he's making it work and he's standing up even though he is not really cut out for it he's about to get it even more like he's still rolling with the punches like that's what makes him endearing to me like that's that's in the one movie shot right there. i think that's the movie, yeah. That, that scene is just the movie. He just keeps going and going, and he, he doesn't give up. Uh, even when he's going home that night, and he's just like, can't even walk. He's so sore, and he tries to do the <laughs> handshake, and he does it in like slow motion because he's so sore. Um, that scene's great, too. Uh, we talked a lot about the frolic scene, the comedy of the frolic scene, the fall frolic, but also that's where the most uh, emotional scene in the movie happens, at least for me, when... He finally gets told by the bully uh, that he has just been a fool. He's been, just been a, a joke of the school the whole time. They actually don't like him. They're just making fun of him. And it's played so well because he doesn't immediately break down. He he first, like, he's he's thinking mm-hmm. about it hard. And then he sees that um, Peggy's still there, and which is his love interest in this. And he he just kind of, like, shrugs it off and smiles. And, ah, doesn't matter. doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and then... Uh, and then he, he breaks down when he sees her looking at him and seeing that he can actually trust her and be himself with her. Um, and he breaks down and literally cries. And here's one area where I think uh, Harold Lloyd went too far because he actually cuts that scene when he re-releases it in 1949. He cut the, the crying scene. He thought, I guess he, he, there was this wow. thing in the 50s and 60s where they, they didn't like sentimental, like they, they didn't, they, there was like, I guess the stigma that silent era films are too sentimental and they cut out scenes like that uh they're apparently the estate of keaton or the estate of chaplin cut out a lot of scenes in the kid that they with the mother that they consider to be too sentimental um luckily we have those scenes back in with the criterion edition which is great and luckily we have it back in here uh with this film because i think that scene is great and i would that's kind of the whole turning point of the film where then he can go into the the last act the football scene with you know embracing himself and being his his own character and when he finally snaps at the end uh, and just starts screaming uh, like at the coach and at the other players and he's just like this different person uh, I think that's hilarious and I think that's great acting I think Harold Lloyd's acting really gets Mm -hmm. to come through in those scenes I think he's great in this Um, yeah he's really really grown on me I like him a lot um i going back to like you I I love the the inner titles I actually found them quite funny (laughs) yeah Uh, I love how it's like uh, Peggy, the kind of uh, girl your mother must have been. <laughs> yeah, that's a good and one. then you kind of like laugh at it. And then it's like, 
it fades in on her and she's this very beautiful young woman and it's almost like a joke on the audience where it's like you don't want to think of your mother as this beautiful desirable young woman um uh that i thought was very funny um but then also uh i i really like uh the the uh when Harold Lloyd is doing all the chants. You have like the very expressive yeah. title cards coming at you. That was fun. I don't know how I don't faithful that is to the time, but uh, you know we got to have that now, and I find it very entertaining and uh, exciting. Yeah, and I'm always interested in that stuff as a graphic designer, like because I don't even know how they did that kind of stuff back then. There's no computers. How are you doing like animated text across the screen? It's it's so it's crazy, uh, and it looks really cool. And then in it's something like uh, Sunrise, where like the yeah. letters are like floating in the water and like that stuff's crazy. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, that's a good segue. Let's go ahead and do that. We talked about the heart. We talked about the comedy. Let's go ahead and jump into some of the filmmaking aspects. Uh, I don't know how much we'll have to say about the directing and cinematography, but let's go there next. What do you think? Uh, I don't know these directors. I don't. I may have seen. I think they've worked with. Um, I think especially the cinematographer I know has worked with. Uh, Harold Lloyd a few times with Safety Last, Speedy, and The Kid Brother, which I also have, but I haven't seen yet. So I'm excited to check that mm. one out because there is some really interesting stuff done with the cinematography. That's what's so cool about these old silent comedies is that they're comedies, but they're really, really competently well-made movies. Like, they just look yes. beautiful. That's that's why they stand the test of time. Like, it doesn't... I mean, obviously, making you laugh is the is the most important thing when you're watching a comedy, but when it looks beautiful too, that's what gets me excited about it. Like I, I'm not a huge comedy. I don't like modern comedy. I, I there's very, very few that I would put on like my you know top 100 list. Um, but for some reason, silent comedies, they just look so cool. Uh, there's such, there's so many interesting things with the cinematography, like little things that they do with the camera. Like when he's on stage in that auditorium scene and he peeks out behind the curtain and sees the whole crowd and he's like super nervous and they like, uh, put the camera out of focus to show that he's nervous. Uh, there's another mm -hmm. scene when he's on the football field and he's just been obliterated by people and he's just all dizzy and they do the double exposure <laughs> of the guy and he's kind of like <laughs> shaking back and forth. Uh, another beautiful shot is the shot where we introduce, it's not an introduction, they actually met on the train before that, but once he gets into his apartment, he's, it's kind of this dusty old uh, dingy room because it's $3 a week and he goes to wipe off the mirror because it's completely covered and as soon as he's wiping it off, it, that's our introduction to Peggy. And she's right there in the frame. Uh, it it mm -hmm. just kind of reveals her character in the mirror uh, behind him, which is really cool. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I think it looks, it's, it's refreshing to see a comedy that is shot uh, so beautifully. No, I completely agree. There's there are those great moments of uh, filmmaking uh, in in the kind of the, the tender small moments, uh, but then even just as a piece of spectacle filmmaking, it's impressive. There are some great tracking shots. You know, early mm -hmm. on you get a little taste of it where they're marching down, yeah. and more and more people are joining the ice cream crowd. Yeah. But then obviously later during the football sequence, there are those wonderful tracking shots that are kind of reminiscent of if you were to watch football today when you have like those overhead behind the player shots um we were like i guess we haven't really progressed in a hundred years <laughs> well and that is the most impressive thing this whole movie to me there there are apparently uh, there's a there is a video essay on here that goes into kind of excruciating detail about the sets and the and the, and the locations that th things were shot at and apparently there are only four colleges uh four college stadiums at the time uh, that were built in California in like the early 20s. And he shoots at three of them for that game. He shoots at three different games. Wow. And he shot during, ha like he had to have the crowd, the, the, the stadium full. There's no CG crowds. He had to have actual people there. So he had to shoot like just on halftime. While they're on, taking, a, taking a break between halves, he's cramming in and getting all that shot. I don't understand how you do that. Like that seems like something you would take all day to shoot. He has like 30 minutes. Like the, the, the meticulous planning of those gags and all those shots that they had to have down so they could just run out there and shoot it real quick is insane. I don't know how, I don't even understand. <laughs> like you're talking about these meticulous shots that's... that he has. He had like 30 minutes. <laughs> I mean, he did it, he went to three different games, but still like, that's insane. No, that is incredible. Um, how long, like, so I didn't know that. <laughs> and so how long did it take him to shoot that sequence total? I mean, he, I think he only went to three games. 
Wow. Wow. <laughs> Which is That's nuts. a lot of rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, like because the, they're not easy shots. Like they're long shots that don't cut with madness going on. Like there's people everywhere. I don't know. And there's a lot of scenes in this that that it makes me seem like he, that he would have had to do like 50 takes because things just happen so perfectly. But I don't know. I don't know if it was just luck or if he was just really good at going with what happened. I have no idea. I don't, like I said, I'm not super familiar with the directors, um, but I know he was just instrumental in, in planning all that stuff. He would, he would plan out all the gags. So he was, and it was his studio. Like he's producing the thing. So mm -hmm. he's, he's basically a director. I, I do want to say, um, you, you know, uh, he's sometimes credited as like, and I, in the intertitle sort of referred to as the school bully. Mm -hmm. I think in like the, 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 uh, cast that we get in the criterion booklet and and it's he's called the college cad yeah. uh, one of my favorite uh side characters like he is a perfectly cast uh jerk <laughs> <laughs> uh, i love how during that climactic football game and everett would cut back to him the way he points and laughs is so funny to me like he's such <laughs> a, a comically cruel bully he makes me laugh <laughs> yeah and it's so satisfying when he gets punched in the face <laughs> at the fall frolic. Yes. <laughs> um, um, I do want to say, uh, so this movie just structurally so influential on just sports movies. Um, actually, this afternoon after watching this movie again, I watched Richard Linklater's 2016 film, Everybody Wants Some, oh, yeah. uh, which is a college about an incoming freshman who plays, a uh, not football, but a baseball. And in this is football. Uh, but you can definitely see the DNA. It's a different kind of movie, but there is that same air of you know a guy trying to just trying to fit in, um, and then you know they take the sport very seriously. But then also, uh, when I was watching it with my brother, he made his observation. You know, the ending, he's won. You know, he's had that spiritual victory, and then like this mousy Shire girl that he has an effect. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this this romance with, she gives him a little note that says "I love you" and that's Rocky, right? Like that's, that's Rocky and Adrian. Um, you watch the ending and it has this big, hilarious uh, football match where it's just, you know, kind of absurd. And you have, you know, these almost like cartoonish pileups and then they'll roll out the stretcher and throw someone on there. <laughs> yeah. um, Robert Altman's film mash ends with the exact same thing. It's a football game between, you know, the characters we've been following and some other team. Uh, even though that's, you know, more of a military scrimmage game, it's still like a big, absurd football game. And actually, last year we got the movie Bottoms, which ends with this absurd, heightened football team where they're just punching each other. <laughs> uh, and it's the same thing. Like You can see the DNA of the freshmen throughout time, even to today. And it was so influential that, I don't know if you know this, Preston Sturges, you know him, loved this movie so yeah. much. Uh, and he loved Harold Lloyd so much that he brought him back out of retirement for a sequel to this. Did you know this? I had no idea. He brought him back. It takes place 20 years later. Uh, it, it picks up right where this movie left off. In fact, Harold Lloyd had to shoot uh, a scene immediately following that where they're carrying him away. He's 20 years later. He's in his 50s. He looks exactly the same still. Uh, it's crazy. And it's, it, is, it is on YouTube. It's called The Sin of Harold Diddlebach. Uh, it's a very Preston Sturgis sounding title, uh, but apparently uh, Howard Hughes got a hold of it and got really involved and like re-edited it and released it as Mad Wednesday, um, and it kind of bombed and it, it wasn't very well regarded. And, and Harold Lloyd doesn't really like it either, unfortunately. But I thought that was really mm -hmm. cool that uh, they made a a movie like 20 years later by Preston Sturgis of all people. Uh, so very influential. And people definitely. Love it. Uh, let's That's go cool. Uh... So go ahead. I mean, we get stuff like that sometimes, too, where, like, you know, uh, Martin Scorsese will direct a sequel to The Hustler, like, yeah. 20 years after it's come out. And, 20 years you know, is, is, bring like back... the, is, like, the time yeah. to do a decades later sequel, apparently. <laughs> that's that's mm -hmm. all, Very way, much. all the way back. We're, like, that next generation of filmmaker, <laughs> you know, wants to pay tribute to those things that were yeah. new back in the day that inspired them. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Uh, so we are highly recommending the Criterion Edition. And it's a lovely edition, too. Um, it's a, it's one of these digi packs that Criterion doesn't do enough of. Uh, I love how this looks. I love that it's made to look like a yearbook. Mm -hmm. All of the, the design is made to look like a yearbook. The booklet that he's holding up, the entire inside design is made to look like a yearbook. 
It's such a cool, such a cool design. Even the cast here is shown uh, as if it's a yearbook page with writing on it and everything. And they're introduced that they don't even have names. Like they're just like you said, the college cad, the college hero, the college bell, the college tailor. Like <laughs> they're 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 named like their uh, <laughs> roles in a yearbook. Uh, and a wonderful essay in here. I did read it. I don't know if you've read this yet. Great read, uh, super quick read, but uh, a very, uh, very fun read and very informative. It's apparently done by a writer who has uh, written for comedians Robert Klein and Dick Van Dyke and the Disney Channel's new Mickey Mouse Club. So he's a comedic writer. Uh, so it's a great read. I'll briefly go through the special, the supplements here uh, because I, I watched these and they are very interesting. Like I said, there's a commentary with two film historians, Richard Carell and Richard Ban and Leonard Maltin. That's a great listen. There is uh, some stuff that's just more geared towards Harold Lloyd himself and not really about the freshman. There is Harold Lloyd's Funny Side of Life, which is a short, like a, which is a compilation film that he released several years later. There's three of his shorts on this disc, which is awesome. I love to see when they include that kind of stuff. Uh, there's a video essay that I mentioned that's very informative called Big Man on Campus. Uh, there's a conversation, a long conversation, like 40 minutes between Richard Carell again and Kevin Brownlow, who did a documentary on Lloyd and was uh, friends with him. And uh, that's very informative as well. And then there is a Delta Kappa Alpha tribute from 1963 where he goes back, Harold Lloyd goes to the college and he's like on stage uh, in an auditorium. Uh, talking and he's much older at that point, but he's hilarious. I just hearing him talk was great because I've only seen him in silent films, but he's really, really funny, uh, really good, just off the cuff uh, talking. And then the the most interesting supplement on here is the What's My Line appearance. He was on the game show hmm. What's My Line, uh, where they try to guess who they're talking to by uh, just asking him like twenty questions, and uh, he was very funny on that as well. Uh, so it was very cool. So a great a great release. I like it quite a bit. I highly recommend it. Uh, any final words on, uh, on the freshman? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that, uh, you know, we talk about like, you know, the different archetypes that they play, um, you know, just very quickly to say, I like how it comments on popularity. Uh, yeah. I like how, you know, they're not all just joking on him. Like there maybe are being endeared to him in some way. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the way the college bell does dance with him, you know, she does want to dance with him, even if she's kind of like gets a gag out of him and the, the college hero is maybe laughing at him, but he does, you know, get him on the team, you know, and then there are kind of these neat little nuances about uh, just popularity and, kind of school dynamics and um, that I really liked. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I would highly recommend checking this out. Um, if you are not familiar with this movie and you're maybe just learning that it's very important to the sports movies, I was describing this movie to uh, my mother earlier and she said that it sounded a lot like Rudy, which I know oh. is based on a true story, but uh, you know, it's very much a movie and they have to structure it somehow. And uh you know, that's not a comedy, but, you know, it's a kind of a movie that's been made for a hundred years. And this is probably like the origin point. So do yourself a favor if you haven't seen it yet and uh, check it out. I, yeah, I would absolutely say. And it's very universal because as someone who doesn't care at all about sports, I think it works really well as a movie by itself. You don't have to care about sports to like it because of that universal thing that it tapped into, like you just mentioned about we've all been there. I personally cared way too much about popularity in high school. I wish I could go back and just, if I had one, I don't really have any regrets, but if I had one thing that I would tell myself, I know it wouldn't work because we'll have to learn the lesson the hard way through life. But if I could just not care about that, because it doesn't matter. I've never seen anyone from my high school since. Like it, it, it really doesn't <laughs> matter. And, it, and, but we get so caught up in it. I think that's what's so relatable about the character. And I think even though, like I said, visually, it's not as timeless as some of the other comedians of his day absolutely like emotionally and at its core it's got that timeless archetype that uh that we all have struggled with at some point unless you're just this massively confident person with a like, <laughs> super high self-esteem which i was not and still am not um but i just care less what people think <laughs> and uh and life's much easier that way and it is just really sweet that like he does he thinks he wants to be popular but what he really wants to do is to just accomplish something Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's great is at the end he has won the affection of them. You know they are imitating his handshake, not to mock him, but to emulate him. That's such. A but he doesn't scene, care. Yeah. He he doesn't care. What he cares is that he's got the love of Peggy, and that's what matters. And yeah. it ends with the 
the shower coming on. It's a <laughs> wonderful little gag to end on. It's beautiful. Oh, it's such a good movie. Uh, that's exactly how Safety lasts too. It ends on like a perfect gag right at the end. Um, I don't remember Speedy. He might that might be a, a trademark of his, but it's a wonderful movie. Thank you so much for recommending it, Connor, or for picking it for this week uh, or this episode. Next episode will be my pick, uh, and I don't know what I'm gonna what I'm gonna show you yet, but I'm gonna try to pick something that you haven't seen, uh, and uh, we'll see where we go. But we will see you guys next episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really enjoy these. Gonna try to make these more consistent going forward. Thank you so much for joining me, Connor. Always a good time talking with you. Be sure to leave some comments down below. Give us your thoughts on this film, uh, what you think about it. I'd love to talk to you more about it down there or just Harold Lloyd in general. Thank you guys so much for that. And I will see you back again in another video real soon. <laughs>